talking about SilverFX Pro and specifically different workflows to kind of think about. I have um, two different kind of tricks. One is a workflow, the other is a trick that you can use SilverFX Pro um, for contrast adjustments in Photoshop and change a blending mode. Really cool, really powerful, and opens up some interesting opportunities because of the algorithms that are built into SilverFX. I also want to show you um, a Sabatier technique, which is um, a take off of something that you would do in the dark room called solarization, or kind of. Um, and then we're going to sort of spend some time utilizing Silver Effects Pro in a slightly different way than, than maybe a lot of folks have, have thought about it. So um, we're going we're gonna to process this image, and I think this photograph, I'm going to minimize my GoToWebinar control panel, by the way. Um, so I can see all of my palettes. And uh, what we have here is a couple layers in Photoshop. I'll talk about what, what those are and why we're using them. This is the original image. And then uh, here is the uh, enhanced image in black and white. We basically are able to relight the photograph because uh, here, the um, our cheetah here is sort of, her face is in shadow. And then in the final image, we kind of open up those shadows nicely so that, um, we have a more compelling image in this case, just a photo that's that's got some more impact. So let's let's start here. So uh, I'm going to delete my Silver Effects Pro layer, and um, I want to mention that this isn't necessarily an advanced workflow or advanced webinar, but it is a different kind of webinar than um, my usual webinars for Silver Effects Pro. Usually I would cover everything in the interface and we talk about all those different aspects. This evening, I wanna show you some different thought processes and uh, techniques. So we're here in Photoshop. Um, I'll just briefly show you, this is the original composite image. Um, and then I used Color Effects Pro for a couple of enhancements, namely um, cross-processing as well as uh, the tonal contrast um, filter as well as, let's see, it was a detail extractor filter. And then I think a dark and light and center as well. Just just to you know be clear with what I did. Uh, going into Silver Effects Pro, I will briefly go over the interface because I imagine there's folks in here that aren't totally comfortable um, or, or familiar with every single thing, but I'm not gonna cover every single thing. So I'll kind of just try to cover uh, the things that I find important for this process. So we're opened into Silver Effects Pro, and, and Silver Effects is basically a black and white conversion software for our color digital images. It's a really powerful tool, and it allows us to, um, you know, take these darkroom techniques into the digital darkroom. It allows us to save presets so that we can create consistent black and white images have consistent workflows, um, and it yields us a, a whole lot of control with control points. Selective editing, post-processing um, can work in both a global manner, where you're affecting the entire image, as well as uh, a selective manner, where you're actually going in and dodging and burning or controlling contrast in different areas. Um, you've got 48 presets that are built into the software. There are 10 sort of brand new presets as of December of last year. Um, and these are now built into the software. I've actually gone in this evening and created uh, one more preset um, that is not built into the software. I'm gonna show you how to build this kind of preset. And um, this is, um, as I click on my preset here, uh, a take on the Sabatier effect um, or a technique that you'd use in the darkroom that is oftentimes called solarization. Um, there's a, a tone inversion. And so it looks really funky and really weird, and uh, it has an interesting black and white effect. And I'll tell you, I'm not using this on every single image, but um, it definitely is a cool effect that can be applied in interesting ways, um, selectively, hypothetically, as well as in global manner, which is what we're kind of doing here. So I'm gonna start from scratch. I'm gonna show you the before and after. So here is the original black and white conversion. And then here's what we get with this Sabatier effect, which is this, this nice kind of graphic feel for um, for this photo. It, it is different on different photos. I'm gonna sh show you two different examples so that you can get a feel for that as well if you're not familiar. Um, for those of you who, who've who worked in the dark room, this is probably something that you've tried before or maybe you're an expert in. Um, I'll show you how to do it here within Silver Effects. Now we're gonna start from scratch in this case. So I've uh, gone back to the all 
preset section in the upper left corner and just clicked on neutral to um, start over from scratch. I'm going to hide those presets because we don't need them over there. And I'm just going to really quickly uh, take a look at the GoToWebinar control panel. Okay, doesn't look like there's any problems. Again, if there is a problem, if your audio cuts out, give it a few seconds. If it doesn't come back immediately, like after a minute or so, log out and log back in and um, it, you'll reconnect and you should regain your audio. So um, in a normal workflow, I would recommend typically starting with the global adjustments or possibly your color filters or film types. Those are three different tools that you can start with. Um, in this case, because I want to show you that Sabatier effect, we're going to go into the film types section, which by the way, there are 18 very popular black and white film types, some of which don't even exist anymore. Um, there are still manufacturers of film. It's actually going quite strong as well. Um, and uh, we are able to digitally recreate those kinds of effects as if this image were shot with a particular kind of film. We're not going to use any of those presets right now. We're going to go into the levels and curves adjustment tool. And um, for anyone not familiar with the levels and curves adjustment tool, uh, the, the levels sort of section of this tool uh, basically allows us to control on the left side the shadows. So we can take the shadows and we can darken them down by bringing them towards the center and creating a steeper curve. It's going to give us more contrast. Uh, or we can go ahead and uh, drag this up. And that's actually going to um, kind of mute the shadows. It, 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 what it does is it actually uh, takes the D-max and it, um, it, it brings it down. The, the darkest density, the, the blackest black now, is really bright. You can see that in the image. And actually, you can see that represented in the histogram in the lower right corner as well. We're going to kind of play off of that, but we're going to change the highlights to begin with. So um, what I want to do is create that tonal inversion for the Sabatier effect. And to do that, I'm going to just take um, my, my highlights, my upper right corner curve adjustment. I'm just going to drag this down. I don't know exactly where yet. It is going to be kind of image dependent. But then the second step is to take another. So basically click on the curve itself, add another curve or add another dot basically and uh, drag this up and then what's happening now is i'm i'm telling the software that the the 255 value the very brightest value in the image the, the highlights themselves are going to be now darker than all of these values right so the to sort of translate that um and again i'm sorry if you're very familiar with curves but basically if if you take this all the way up our highlights are as bright as they're going to get if i start taking this down it takes those highlights, the brightest values, it brings them down. And it actually, in, in uh, Silver Effects Pro, the curve kind of follows those highlights initially because um, the these uh, sort of anchor points, the, the highlight anchor point and the shadow anchor point um, act as uh, kind of guides for the rest. But what we're gonna end up doing is sort of bringing these down. And it, it takes a little playing to get used to and I want to make sure that uh, this line never like pushes up against the very top because we're going to lose more detail that way. Um, but basically, I'm going to create this really funky curve. I might even go into the shadows. Technically, in a, a Sabatier effect, you, you wouldn't actually get shadows going much brighter. Um, but you know, we're doing this digitally, and we can kind of do whatever we want. So uh, we can create a more interesting effect that way. And so that's what we're going to run with. Right, and so we get this really kind of interesting graphic contrast effect. And like I said, I'm not going to use this all the time, um, but it definitely is cool and neat. And um, of course, we can go in and control things selectively with control points. So let's say we we love this effect and um, we want to run with it, but there are some areas in the image that we kind of want to change or clean up. Well, we can just close down levels and curves, move into our global adjustments, and um, go into brightness, contrast, structure, and so on. In fact, I'm going to move into the contrast tools. Uh, for, for folks not familiar with the global adjustments, it's broken down into brightness, contrast, and structure. Um, and if you click on the little triangle that's to the left of any of those labels, it's going to open up into another tool set where we can go in and um, utilize the soft contrast tool, which is doing some interesting stuff both ways. If I bring it uh, into the negative, um, I'm, I'm sort of bringing back some of the shadow detail that's kind of blacked out. And if I um, bring my soft contrast this way to the right, it creates this kind of softening effect a little bit. And I, I actually prefer the softer look and feel in this case. 
So I'm going to run with that one. Um, but I do like the effect of, of kind of lightening up the shadows a little bit. So I'm going to take a control point in the selective adjustment section, take that point, and I'm just going to drop it in this shadow area. And what these control points allow us to do is control the image selectively. And specifically in silver effects, we have control over brightness, contrast, and structure. And then there's a little triangle, expand collapse box, that's at the bottom of each control point. If you click on it, it opens up into uh, amplify whites, amplify blacks, fine structure, and even selective colorization if you wanted to do a selective colorization effect. So by dropping my control point down here in the water, I can kind of open up some of these shadows a little bit. I'm happy with that. Uh, let's just take a quick look at the before and after. This is a really kind of funky workflow. It's doing some cool stuff. And let's say I'm happy with that because it's been 14 minutes since we started. Um, I can save this as a preset, and then we can apply this on other images whenever we might want to. And in fact, to do that, I'm going to open the preset browser back up. So I've got to move into the upper left corner of the interface. And then I need to move into the custom section of our uh, presets. And I'm going to go ahead and just click the plus button in the custom section. Uh, as you click the plus button, this is how you add a preset. And anything that you've done to your image in a global manner, mind you, will be saved into this um, preset by default. So um, the control points are not going to be saved in this way, which is kind of good because typically when we bring another image into Silver Effects, we're going to want to use selective control points in different portions of the photograph. Um, now, I'm going to name this, uh, it's two Bs, no, two Ts, sub TA. Yeah, that looks right. And I'm going to call this two because I have a preset already. Um, that's sub TA effect one. So I'm going to save this uh, right here. And as I click the OK bot button, the custom section is actually going to open up. So it went from our standard preset library, which houses all of the presets that are built into the software, into the custom preset library, which is where any presets that you've saved are going to be saved into here. Um, so what do we got? Sabatia effect 2 and Sabatia effect 1. So I've got my two presets, and we're going to be able to take a look at what these two different presets do uh, um, as we open up a different photograph as well. I actually prefer the first effect a little bit more, but this is a little bit more subtle, the second effect that we've created. Now that we're done editing our image, we're going to go ahead and just click the OK button. We've created a preset. We've messed around with a Sabatier effect, which is, again, something that's going to be very different. And I hope I'm pronouncing that properly. Um, I only know the word from reading it. Um, I've actually done this in the darkroom quite a few times since high school, um, and so I got excited when I thought about it and was like, what can I show for this webinar? That would be really kind of cool. Anyways, there we go. We've got our finished image. And what, by the way, for folks who um, are, are new here, um, when using Silver Effects Pro or any of the Nick plugins in Photoshop, what happens is your background image, it, you, you have what's called like a merge stamp visible. So your, your background pixels or whatever your layers are looking like there are going to be copied and then uh, the adjustment is going to be applied to a completely separate layer uh, so that we can kind of maintain uh, the ability to go back to these other layers when necessary. And that, that actually becomes very important in another uh, workflow, two of the other workflows that I want to show you today. I'm going to go ahead and close this image. I'm going to just take a quick look um, at our Go to webinar control panel. Cool. Thank you, Millie. I appreciate that. Um, and I'm going to keep these questions for for um, after. Why oh, x input value y? Okay, got it, Michael. I'm going to keep these questions for later on. Uh, why did you use color effects before importing to silver effects instead of global adjustments in PhotoLab or Lightroom? Got it, My, Matt. I'm going to answer that question later on as well. Okay, keep them coming. Let's keep chatting. So um, I, I just wanted to show you the presets on this image just because it's a very different photograph than the last photo. So we're going to open up into Silver Effects Pro. Uh, this, was, this was a photograph that was shot kind of on the side of a, another set that we were working on. Uh, we were testing a camera for a camera manufacturer. And um, we, we found some models and um, hired a production crew and, and worked in this really beautiful location. Uh, the light was really beautiful, so we kind of just shot on the side with um, our Nikon and Canon cameras as well. Anyways, um, custom presets. 
moving into our uh, preset Sabatier effect. So here's uh, Sabatier effect one, right? And so completely different kind of effect. What what I'm interested in here, what I find to be very interesting here is um, this tonal inversion creates this otherworldly kind of effect and it, it absolutely creates this kind of graphic sense. Uh, if If we look at this side by side, you've got the original image and then we've got our Sabatier effect. And it's just so cool what it does uh, to these bright highlight areas. It inverts all of those tones. And it does some interesting stuff uh, on her um, dress there as well. So that's that's the Sabatier effect one. Here's Sabatier effect two. So a completely different effect. And that's that's for two reasons. Well, multiple reasons, but mostly because the curve that I've added is so different for this Sabatier effect one. And I also used the Kodak Tmax Pro uh, preset, and then I also utilized some contrast and a, maybe some structure. No structure, just contrast. So the effect becomes, you know, very different bef between those two presets. But if I were to apply this preset on another image of, from the same series, I'm going to get a nice consistent look between those images. Um, you know, if if the the tonal range and contrast has a similar feel. Like let's say we have several images that look similar to this, uh, maybe some close-ups, maybe some further out. Um, that's going to be able to create a, a consistent look and feel between those different photographs. All right, let's say we love this. Let's go ahead and click the OK button in the lower right corner. It's going to bring us back over into Photoshop. And I'm I'm really tempted to show you the another workflow with this image, but I, I want to just move through this, these images, not as quickly as possible, but I've got a bunch of photos to show you. Um, just two more workflows, really. But one of these workflows, I want to show you a couple times because uh, you, you can get completely different effects depending upon how you go about thinking um, of your image. So I'm going to close that image. I'm going to say, don't save. And then it keeps going to our, our um, cheetah there. So uh, this image, actually has Silver Effects Pro applied to it, but we still have color, right? So this is a really interesting, fun um, um, filtration, fun uh, effect. And uh, the beauty of what's going on here is that it, it, it allows us to use the contrast and texture controls that are built into Silver Effects Pro, they're proprietary to Silver Effects Pro, but on a color photograph. So um, I'm, I don't know if I need to explain this first layer. There's a huge dust spot on my sensor. In fact, there's a couple. Um, so I kind of just got rid of it after the fact because it was um, really became much more noticeable uh, after I added some contrast using silver effects. So let's delete these layers. Um, this this photo, even if you're not terribly interested in it, I, I just find it to be kind of ironic and not necessarily funny, but um, this is this is um, one of the Great Lakes, and right now there are uh, issues with flooding around the Great Lakes, and um, you know this is a a state. So this was um, made probably by the county, actually, right, or maybe the town. But this is like the stopgap or the fix for uh, you know the problem of the road basically running off into the lake. Anyways, um, I'm going to move into Silver Effects Pro. We don't need to talk about the photograph or its content so much. I want to show you this technique. So um, let's minimize those presets. And what I want to do, this, this thought process is a little bit different and a little bit strange, right? Because we have a black and white image now, but I want to apply uh, all of our effects to a color photograph. So the we have to kind of think about how the color is going to render when we go into uh, back into Photoshop. And so if you're going to use this technique, um, color filters will look really funky and strange uh, if you utilize something like the red or blue color filter um, as a contrast control with the image in color. I'm not saying it doesn't work, it's just kind of difficult to see how this is going to translate. So I uh, tend to avoid the color filter for this technique, um, and I will sometimes use the film effects, I'm sorry, not film effects, the film types, and then also all of the contrast controls and oftentimes control points. So uh, I, I really love what happens to this photograph uh, with the Kodak Tmax Pro preset, uh, but I'm going to lessen our, I'm going to, I'm going to uh, adjust the curve a little bit 
and I'm going to add contrast um, selectively and globally, but not necessarily using the film type that I've, I've applied. So basically, I'm using this as a preset. I'm adjusting this preset uh, because I like what it's doing in the color sensitivity range, as well as it's adding a little bit of grain. If, if you don't want any grain added to your image, knowing that you're going to be you know, converting it back into color, you could take your grain per pixel slider all the way over to 500, and that's going to get rid of any grain uh, that might be applied on this photograph. In fact, let's do that. That'll keep it clean for us. I do like what this image looks like when it's got some grain on it, but um, that's besides the point. So uh, back up to global adjustments for this really cool contrast technique. So in global adjustments, under brightness, you have a sort of standard brightness adjustment, but you also can control the highlights separately from the midtone, separately from the shadows. And you also have what's called dynamic brightness. And that's the kind of killer image or killer um, uh, algorithm it's proprietary here within the Nick plugins, and you'll find it, I think, within maybe a couple of the filters in Color Effects Pro, if I remember correctly, and then here in Silver Effects Pro. So uh, what this slider does, if I take it to the left, is it's going to darken down all of the brightest values um, more so than the darker values, right? So it takes the brightest stuff and darkens it down, but it retains shadow detail really nicely. If I take this slider the opposite direction, it's going to brighten up the shadows and brighten up the darker values, but it's going to try to retain the very brightest values. And how that's different is that if you were to just take a brightness slider or maybe even an exposure slider to the left or to the right, um, it's, it's basically going to darken everything down uh, at the same rate, if you will. Brightness and exposure algorithms will work slightly differently than each other, um, but this brightness and br dynamic brightness are very different in terms of this dynamic brightness allows me to darken the photo, darken those highlights, but still retain the shadow texture and shadow detail nicely. So I like that dynamic brightness. I'm going to leave it about there. We're going to move into contrast. In the contrast section, uh, you have a standard contrast adjustment. You can amplify the whites, amplify the blacks, and soft contrast. Now, amplify the whites, this is going to allow us to, um, well, basically take the lighter values of every individual object and brighten them up. So as you open up into Silver Effects Pro, the, the image kind of assesses edges, figures out where those edges are, and tries to look at and, and kind of create, um, uh, not a mask necessarily, but delineation between objects. And when you amplify the whites, what's happening is it, it looks at those lines and edges and objects, if you will, and it brightens the brightest values that are in those individual little objects. In fact, if if we were to zoom in, so I'm going to go into 100%. I've, I actually made these files a little bit smaller. This is a 36 megapixel file originally. I made it 12 megapixels, so it's faster for us to work with over the webinar because the webinar system is sort of intensive as we're trying to stream this stuff. So uh, it speeds up our whole process a bit. Um, so as I amplify the whites, if we watch, you know, these guardrails, you'll notice the highlight areas in the guardrails get brighter, and some of the brighter values back here and these, the, the flowers and so on, and the brush back there, they are going to be affected, but the shadows really aren't. And it's a really beautiful tool, and it's a really wonderful contrast adjustment that, again, you're really only going to be able to find within a few of the filters and color effects, and then here within silver effects, where we have like the, the, the total workflow with all of these different tools. Amplify blacks does something very similar, but in the shadows, in the darkest values. I don't know if we need that necessarily. I'm going to leave that out. I'm going to bring that back to zero. And I'm going to add a little bit of soft contrast. Creates a little bit of this glowing effect. And then we'll move into structure. Structure is, uh, for the most part, a texture adjustment tool. And um, what it does is it takes that same sort of edge detection and detail sort of detection idea concept that the software is using um, as you open up the software. And um, it basically is going to bring us uh, more texture, right? It's it's not increase. Or I'm, not, I'm sorry, it's not creating texture. It's taking the information that's already there, and it's kind of sharpening the edges of those areas a bit. But it's doing it in such a way that it acts differently than, let's say, an unsharp mask or some other kinds of technical sharpening things. It's called structure because it's it's aiming for these small textures. And now we're getting this kind of nice pop out of the image. In fact, if we take a look at the before and after, this is the image, this is the original, it's kind of linear, a little bit flat. Here's the enhanced, now we've got some impact. 
Now, I've got two problems that I'm seeing as I've added some structure. Uh, I, I'm darkening down these shadows more than I want to. Uh, I think we've actually got detail in there, and we can tell by moving into uh, the zone mapping system, which is in the lower right corner of the interface. Uh, this system basically indicates to us uh, where all of our values are, kind of in the histogram. And it, it, it's broken into um, 11 different zones. And uh, the zone zero would be black without detail. So if I click on this, you'll note that I have some areas over here that's black with no detail. And then I've got some areas in the branches up in the tree that's also black with no detail. I'm not terribly concerned with these areas, although we can fix that with a control point. I definitely want to fix this area on the left side of the frame uh, with some control points. And then um, my sky is a little bit bland and drab. You can see that in my histogram, but almost all of the tones in my sky fall in about zone eight. And so that's that's a little bit gray. It's a, I, I kind of want a little bit more contrast and texture out of those areas. So uh, we're going to do that using some control points. The first thing I want to do, though, let's take care of those little shadow details uh, over here on the right side of the frame. So again, these control points, what they're doing is allowing us to make selective dodging and burning effects, brightening and dot, or sorry, brightening and, and darkening down of areas, and also controlling contrast really nicely. And it's doing this without us having to worry about making selections, which is my favorite part about it. Uh, we just drop the control point. It makes a photographic looking selection. It's going in and looking for the similar tones and colors and textures. And then it basically makes the selection for us. As I've brightened that area, I've noticed that um, some of the values in the details in here are a little bit muted now. They don't look as good as they did. So I'm gonna take another control point, place it in here, and um, I'm gonna add in some structure and maybe even brighten those values and add a little contrast um, just to sort of direct your attention towards those areas. So it's not, I don't, I don't want that to be the focus, but I want there to be some good detail in there um, to show how you know, nature's kind of reclaiming um, its area. All right, so uh, control point in this section. I'm gonna turn off that zone mapping. And the way you turn off the zone mapping is you just click on it again. You can see my zone zero is in my lower right corner of the interface is um, highlighted. I wanna click on that again, it turns it off. And now I don't have to worry about those little lines showing up and possibly distracting me. The next thing I do wanna do though, drop a massive control point right in the middle and see what happens if I start darkening that down, adding a little bit of structure for detail and texture. A little bit of contrast. I'm pretty happy with that. You you start to see how dirty this camera sensor is, though, right? And um, we we would clean that up afterwards because those the dust spots were there originally in the capture, um, but they're not as noticeable because the the low contrast scene. So um, I'm I'm using a shortcut to create new control points. By the way, it's Shift Command A. And that's gonna basically yield me a little crosshair so that I can create new control points. It's just a faster way of working. Uh, let's say we're happy with our result. I'm gonna take a quick look at the before and after using the compare button. There's the before, there's the after. We've got a lot more pop, more impact, depth. I'm liking it. The last thing I'm gonna do is move into finishing adjustments. We're gonna use a burn edge to just burn the bottom edge in, just a little. And we'll have it encroach into the center a little bit more and have it sort of have a softer transition as well. So we're basically, we're able to just burn the corner, or, or sorry, burn the bottom edge here. The, the burn edges tool allows you to burn each individual edge, darken down each individual edge separately. In this case, I'm just gonna darken down the bottom. Uh, it helps to sort of push your attention as the viewer in towards the center a little bit more. When we're all done editing, we click that OK button in the lower right corner, brings us back over into Photoshop, and this is gonna yield us a black and white image. The trick to getting the color back on the photograph is to go into the blending modes. So I, I should mention, you can only do this technique when using Adobe Photoshop, um, unless you are also using another piece of software somehow with silver effects that has layers and layer masks. So um, here we're in um, our, our layers palette. And if I go into my blending modes and I switch from the normal blending mode down into the luminosity blending mode, we're gonna get our color back but now we have the contrast adjustment from silver effects. Now, oftentimes I kind of overdo my contrast adjustment 
And uh, that actually ends up being totally fine because you can take the opacity of the layer itself and start dropping that down a bit. So I'll bring this to maybe 80%, and now we've got 80% of our Silver FX Pro contrast adjustment. The only complaint that I have in this image is now my stop sign doesn't look like it's the correct color. So uh, I would probably go in with some different techniques and kind of get that color back in the stop sign because that it's not only is it a memory color, but it's like a it's a very recognizable memory color. Whereas you know everything else is sort of a believable color in tone with this added contrast. The stop sign to me is is not. All right, I'm going to leave that one open because I assume we'll probably have a question or two about that technique. Um, all right. So, um, all right, a couple more webinar or questions. We look good. So I, I like to check the GoToWebinar control panel once in a while, ladies and gentlemen, just to make sure that there are no major technical problems because I don't have it up on screen most of the time. This is baby Ellie. Um, the original photograph looks like this. And what we're gonna do is actually apply several different layers of Silver Effects Pro and those different layers will have dramatically different effects on them. So I've already got my large thumbnails on, but hopefully you can see the difference in the actual black and white conversion. I'll just show it to you. So um, this first black and white conversion does kind of the opposite of what most folks would probably do with a portrait of a baby. I, I'm applying a blue color filter to kind of create this really dark, ruddy skin. Um, it's beautiful to me, and it's kind of funny because it brings out all of that yellow um, uh, the banana that the baby had just eaten. Maybe it's carrots. I don't actually know. Um, and then uh, basically we're we're going to turn off this layer and reconvert from our color image. I'm going to show you that. Um, this is an opacity of 82, but basically it's a completely different black and white conversion where I'm getting a much darker bib and then um, bringing out a little more texture in the baby's eyes. And then uh, this last layer we would never ever do to probably any portrait, uh, we're going to reduce some contrast here or there, and then we're basically going to use layer masks to create um, a composite image. And the beauty of this workflow is it allows us to reuse the color information over and over and over again as many times as we want to create an image that couldn't otherwise exist. Right, it, you'd never be able to do this with a piece of film. You've got we've got multiple different um, color filters going into these things, and, and multiple different layers of our black and white conversion. So let's look at how to do this, and we're going to do it relatively quickly on the first one, and I'm going to reiterate it on another image uh, with the cheetah, and then another image with this sort of um, uh, I don't know. It's a sorry, <laughs> as I switch over into images, um, this is the Albany State Capitol building in uh, New York. Anyways, Ellie. So we're gonna click on Silver Effects Pro. As that opens, I'm gonna take a sip of my water, pardon. And um, the, the thought process here is that I wanna pay attention to certain parts of the image and not other parts. So um, the, the idea is that I'm able to, you know, reconvert this image from color to black and white, which means I can take the best parts of the image or interesting parts of the image maybe and brush them together using uh, silver effects pro well sorry using layers in photoshop but combined with silver effects pro so in this case we're going to move into our color filter i'm going to click on i think the green color filter no i want the blue color filter and then i'm going to go ahead and increase that blue color filter a bit um, and what, what this is doing for for anyone who's never used this tool before uh, the color filters emulate what a glass color filter do, would do when shooting black and white film. Um, and, and what that does is basically if you, if you were to click on the red color filter, anything that's red or on that end of the color spectrum, let's say uh, red, yellow, and into orange, or red, orange, into yellow, um, and maybe a little bit into green, uh, that's going to brighten up those values. And it's going to darken down any of the colors that are on the opposite end of the color spectrum. So uh, neutral looks like this. The red color filter finds her pink bib and her skin, and it lightens it up because it's primarily on that end of the color spectrum. If I go to yellow or green or blue, what that's doing is it's lightening the similar colors on that end of the color spectrum. 
and darkening the opposite colors. So because her skin is primarily red and yellow, when we click on the blue color filter, it's basically darkening those tones down. So it, it has to do with transmission of light through these filters. Now that in, in the film world, um, here in the, in the digital world, it's basically translating those colors in a different way. Um, anyways, I like what's happening here. I'm gonna move into global adjustments. I, I would most of the time kind of go in and play for a few minutes on each one of these different layers. Uh, for the sake of our time here, I, I'm not going to go too extensive. I just want to show you some things that have a lot of impact and then brush them together uh, so that you can kind of get a sense of the workflow. But the, the, what's, what's so powerful about this is it allows you to do almost anything you want on all of these different areas in the image and then combine them together. So I'm happy with this as our base. So I'm go going to go ahead and click the OK button. So we're going to use this as the kind of base layer for the overall image. I was basically only paying attention to her skin tone, but I like what's happening. So I'm going to click the OK button. The trick here is once we get back over to Photoshop, before we go into Silver Effects Pro again, we have to turn off the Silver Effects Pro layer and then click on the background. And when you do that, now we're going to be reconverting the image that's in color into black and white. If you leave this layer on and you go back into Silver Effects Pro, it's it's not going to work the way that you you want it to, at least um, in the way that this workflow works. Um, so you got to make sure to turn off that layer by clicking that little eyeball off on the layer, go into the background, and then go back to Silver Effects Pro. This is going to reconvert the image from color to black and white, and now we're going to pay attention to a different part of the photograph. In this case, I'm going to move into my color filters. I'm going to click on my green color filter. I love what that's doing to the bib. We're, we're getting so much more contrast. You can you can really read this, but you still get a sense of the light um, in the in the material um, because of the lighting here. I'm just going to add a couple control points here and there um, to dodge and burn just a touch, too much, a little bit of contrast. And then I'm going to take a control point and place it on her eye. Be very careful if you're going to go in and adjust um, eyes because it becomes quite obvious if you go too far. In fact, I'm going to I'm going to take this a little bit too far, knowing that I'm going to end up bringing my opacity of the layer down a little. So I'm going to go ahead and brighten her eyes, add a little contrast, and add a little bit of um, structure. In the 50 megapixel file, this was this was shot with a Fuji GFX 50. Uh, it actually ends up being a self-portrait of me uh, in her eye, which is fun. But anyways, um, I, I figured folks might see that, so I was just going to mention it. Now, um, I want this control point duplicated, put it in the other eye. There's three ways to do that. The one way that I'm going to show you right now is that you hold the Option key down on a Mac or Alt if you're on a PC. While you're holding Option or Alt, click on the control point, drag it away. Now I'm going to duplicate in the other eye. Now the other eye is a little bit more in shadow than before, so, than, the, than um, her right eye, camera left. Uh, so I'm going to bring the um, brightness adjustment down just a little bit because this eye is a little more um, in shadow. Just a little anyways, it's kind of open light. Now let's say we're happy with this result. We click the OK button. That brings us over into Photoshop. Now uh, if I turn on my background layer, my, uh, my first Silver Effects Pro background layer, nothing really happens. Um, but if we toggle these on and off, you can see a dramatic difference. So there's the original, there's the new. And what we're going to do is use a layer mask. So um, if you follow me in the layers palette here in Photoshop, there's a little square that has a circle in it. And I I, we're not able to really talk about all of the details of layer masking because we could go on for days. But basically what we're going to do is hold the Option key down on a, on a Mac or Alt on a PC and add a layer mask. What that does is it adds a black layer mask, which is going to conceal uh, our entire layer. And what we'll do is we'll use a brush in Photoshop, and a, it's got to be a white brush or some tone that's brighter than black. Um, we're going to use a white one because it'll just end up being fast and easy. Um, and brush in our effect. So I'm going to tap B on my keyboard. I'm going to make sure my foreground color over in the tools palette on the left side of Photoshop is white. And then I'm just gonna go ahead and paint the effect in. And I should be using a Wacom tablet and I should be really paying attention to the edges of this. But for the sake of time, for our demonstration, I'm just gonna do this really quickly. I'm gonna go over the bib 
and I'm going to go over any other area that I want to have come through. So I want displayed from this particular layer. So I want her eyes and uh, the bib in this case. See, it, now her eyes look kind of scary, especially on um, you know compared to the dark ruddy skin tone. Um, I would actually like to print this image huge and then give it to her parents. Um, I think they would think it was both strange and um, maybe actually similar to her personality. <laughs> She's a lovely baby. So uh, let's say we're happy with this. I'm gonna turn off these two layers. I'm gonna go back into our color and then we're gonna convert one more time. This time, I'm not gonna pay attention to the baby. I'm gonna kind of pay attention more to the background and I'm gonna go, um, I'm gonna go crazy here and take the contrast into, or with a soft contrast into the negative. And that is gonna go really funky on the baby's skin tone. Um, but we're gonna end up with an interesting effect when we start combining those layers together. And so this is where kind of getting used to and playing with uh, these different algorithms um, kind of come into play. These different sliders are gonna allow us to do all sorts of really interesting stuff when we start combining these things together. Uh, it's just a matter of figuring out how they're gonna work together. So let's say we love this. Uh, we click the OK button, and we actually, technically we could click the brush button, but um, I think the brush button, let's click it, I'll show you what it does. I think we're gonna be, we're not gonna be able to turn on the background layers to see what's happening. Nope, I lied, we can. So now uh, what we've done is I've clicked the brush button, and when you do that from the Nick plugins in Photoshop, it actually turns on a new black layer mask for us. So it actually did a little bit of the work for us. And what you'll do is move into the Nick Selective tool here, click Paint. I'm gonna minimize that for a second so we can see what's going on in the image. Um, and I'm gonna paint the effect in where we want it. So I'm gonna size my brush to be a bit bigger, and I'm gonna go ahead and brush this in where we want it to be. I'm gonna avoid hitting the baby here because it did some weird stuff in the skin tone. Um, but now we've got this, you know, best of both worlds, if you will, or best of three different worlds, um, if, if we say that. I, I understand that um, folks might not necessarily like this process on this image with, with the choices that I've made, but it is an image that is like no other. You know, the, the, you couldn't easily do this any other way. And uh, we've got this really beautiful, wonderful way of combining these different layers together uh, that can yield you some really beautiful and interesting effects. Now I'm coming up on time here, 7.45. Oh, I forgot to do something. Um, your selective editing mode. So so I haven't, I never clicked okay or to finish um, our, our brushing because usually I actually don't use that brush button. I just generate my own layer mask for, because of habit. But when you're done brushing your stuff in or out using the Nick Selective tool that we just did use, you have to click the apply button to apply those settings. So I'm gonna click apply, that kind of finishes it off and um, now we can go into a different image. I'm gonna do this one quick because um, it's 7.47 and we are kind of out of time and I wanna give you guys the opportunity to ask any questions you might have and I imagine we have a lot of questions. So one of the questions that I saw come in earlier um, was why didn't I use Photolab 2 to use control points um, on the image before converting the image in silver effects? Uh, and that was that was in reference to uh, the the architectural photo that we saw with the three sort of spires going up um, with the reflection of the water, and we used the Sabatier effect. I used Color Effects Pro, um, and I used some of the filters that are in Color Effects Pro that do different things than what Photo Lab Two um, is able to do for us. So that that's why I I made that choice. In this case. Um, if I were to reprocess this original raw file, which I, I didn't do for this workshop or this webinar, um, this would have been easy. So technically, this layer right here is actually um, a second raw processed image uh, of her eyes where I brightened them up. I could do that very easily in Photo Lab 2 at this point. Now, the next layer is a Color Effects Pro 4 layer and um, I'm using tonal contrast again, and I'm basically bringing out some more texture on her. It's relatively subtle. So here's the before, 
and here's the after. And you can see it kind of dramatically actually in the, the tree that our uh, cheetah is sitting on. But that's that was my thought process there. So um, we're gonna go into silver effects. I'm gonna do this one quick. And actually it should be relatively easy because it's almost the same set of filters using the blue color filter, but here taking the dynamic contrast down, maybe not that far. Um, dynamic brightness rather, adding some amplify blacks, adding a little bit of contrast. And what I'm doing, or as I'm doing this, I'm paying attention to the background. I'm paying attention to the entire image in this case, except for our cheetah and except for maybe the trees, um, the fallen tree that she's standing on. Um, so let's say I'm happy with this overall result. I'm gonna move in and start using control points. So I'm just gonna darken these tones down just a bit. And uh, again, I'm, I'm going quickly simply that so I can show you another example of that same kind of workflow. Take a quick look at the before and after. There's the original conversion. Here's the enhanced image. I have no idea why this was resed down to six megabytes or six megapixels. It should be 12, probably closer to 10 since I cropped square, I guess. Um, so we made our enhancements. I'm gonna reduce structure. It's gonna sort of smooth out that background because where I want you to be looking in the long run is at our cheetah. Right, and so by reducing the structure, I will be reducing the texture, and therefore, um, in, in the background, and therefore, hopefully, directing your attention towards the cheetah a little bit more. Place a couple of control points in the background. I love these sort of zigzag lines that are happening, so I'm going to bring those out a little bit. Maybe drop a point here, brighten that up five percent. Very subtle, if I can be, and then um, I'm going to click the OK button. All right, so from there, I turn off my Silver Effects Pro layer, click on one of my other background layers, and then just click into Silver Effects again, and this will reconvert. This time, instead of paying attention to the background, I'm gonna pay attention to um, our cheetah. I'm gonna actually brighten her up a little bit. I'm gonna add some contrast on her. Let's let's go crazy and see what happens. Let's Let's really brighten her up. Let's really add some contrast. Because now that we have a kind of base layer, we're going to be able to utilize an opacity um, if, if necessary, should we decide we needed to do that. Uh, this side of her face is kind of in shadow, so I'm going to dodge that a bit. And um, yeah, I think I, let's say we love this. I'm going to say that that's good. I'm happy. Um, and again, for the sake of time, we click the OK button. Or actually this time, let's click the brush button again. Uh, usually when utilizing this, if I'm if I know I'm going to be actually making something and spending time to do this process. I'm also going to plug in my my pen tablet, my Wacom tablet, and um, I'm going to zoom in and I'm really going to pay attention to my edges um, as we're brushing this effect in. So this, this workflow can be time consuming. So if you're a wedding photographer or an event photographer and having to deal with hundreds or thousands of images, um, this would be something for portfolio work maybe, not necessarily a bulk of a whole bunch of images. So whereas the preset sort of workflow that we looked at earlier still yields you really great and amazing results and also consistent results, um, this this is a you know different kind of workflow for possibly either a different kind of photographer or at least different kinds of um, applications. This would be for a print uh, or you know, a, a portfolio piece um, or a contest or something like that, probably. All right, so I've painted her in. Let's turn our background layer on. I'm happy with that, except I have this glow around her, right? And the glow is occurring because my mask isn't very good and because of this you know, massive contrast difference between um, her in the previous layer and her in the background, or her in this layer. I am gonna start by just pulling the opacity down a little bit. That's gonna kind of blend the two a little. And then um, I need to click the erase button in the NIC control panel, um, the NIC selective tool. And then I will erase the effect out. And again, zooming in is gonna make this much easier. I'm just gonna do this quickly so that you can get a sense of it. I think I messed up over on this edge a little. There we go. And then maybe even erasing some of the effect out in some of the areas where we could use a little shadow because lightening these areas isn't always the best thing to do. Right, the the highlight areas that's going to kind of um, be exaggerated nicely, 
And then these shadow areas, they're going to help to give us a little more form. So the highlights are going to reveal the detail, and the shadows are going to reveal the form. Cool. That didn't work. Uh, paint. Lower my opacity. Yep. So there are some a couple little limitations that I found, I guess, when using this as your, your um, when, when using the Nick Selective tool instead of just utilizing a kind of standard workflow for uh, your layer masks, it didn't let me fade my um, selection and it, it sort of limited me a couple times. Okay, so I would finish this with probably another layer. In fact, I'm just gonna finish it. I'm just gonna show you what I would do. So um, when I printed this initially, uh, it was slightly larger than this, but uh, what I did is I'd float it on a white field so I, 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 this image was, you know, eight by eight inches or so, um, or 10 by 10 inches. I would put it on a piece of paper. I'd print it on a piece of paper uh, that's more like a 13 by 19. So it's this smaller image that's kind of floating in the middle of this white paper, and it can be, it can look really beautiful. Um, and to do that, instead of having just square edges around it, I, I would apply, not always, I'm generalizing, uh, I would apply a film effect or a film edge from silver effects. So let me show you a trick. Uh, first thing I'm gonna do so that I don't encroach into the image with this technique because the film edge that we'd be applying in silver effects encroaches into the pixels is in Photoshop, I'm gonna expand my canvas out and that's, that's basically going to make it so that when I encroach into pixels, I'll just be encroaching into the white edge. So that'll make more sense in a second. If I hit uh, Option Command C on a Mac, I believe that's um, Alt Control C on a PC, if I remember correctly. Um, it my canvas size, that's a canvas size shortcut, allows me to, in a relative way, add about 150 pixels. And um, this is going to give me 150 pixels of a white edge around uh, all four of the sides of our image. So we kind of have this white border. And then from there, oh, that's funky. Anyways, from there, I would go into Silver Effects one more time. Maybe I would do this in Color Effects because I think I would probably apply a Dark and Light and Center filter. But uh, long story short, I would move into my Finishing Adjustments, move into my Image Borders, and choose one of these Image Borders. I particularly like Image Border Type 1. And you can see what it's doing. It encroaches into the photo. Right, so this white or this uh, tone border, black tone border, sort of a stroke around uh, the image. It's trying to emulate what you, what could happen in the dark room if you took your film holder and filed it down. Found, wow, filed it down a bit. Um, but now I'm going to just encroach until we're hitting the pixels of our uh, the edge of our image. So we're going to lose a couple pixels, and then um, I can adjust my image border to create uh, a nice rounded edge or something that has a little more pizzazz to it, you know, with a nice thick edge if we wanted that kind of film effect stroke around the sides. I'm going to go ahead and just take the spread down to negative 100, and all this is going to do is it gives me this kind of, I would say, a more organic kind of edge. So instead of having the 90 degree really hard edge, it rounds off those edges, and then um, we can actually make it clean or rough, and that's going to change the feel of the edge as well. Long story short, we click the OK button, and that's that, ladies and gentlemen. I'm, I'm coming up on my time. Um, I will gladly answer any questions that you have if I can answer them. Um, I realized halfway through that I never introduced myself. My name is uh, Dan Hughes. I was the webinar trainer for Nick Software from 2009 to 2014. And um, I, I teach photography at the Rochester Institute of, of Technology in Rochester, New York. So I teach at a university, and uh, we use these tools in the curriculum. So all of the freshmen learn HDRFX Pro, and then um, I show these all of these different plugins to um, different students. In a couple of weeks, I'm going to be teaching. Um, I'm, I'm going to go into my friend Eric Kinsman's class. Um, and talk to them about sharpening for output using Sharpener Pro. It should be fun. Anyways, ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to answer these questions for the next 15 minutes or so, but if you've got to head out, I greatly appreciate you coming out. Hopefully you found this to be a beneficial demonstration. This webinar is being recorded, and it you should get an email in about 24 hours. You should, as far as I know, um, w with a link. Um, I do also know that, that DxO has been posting these webinars 
on YouTube. So if you go to the uh, Nick Software page on YouTube, you can find some of these contemporary webinars as well. All right. Thank you, Jill. Thank you, Millie. I greatly appreciate that. Hopefully, these are it's a this is a fun webinar for sure. Great. It's a very different kind of um, um, webinar than usual, and the techniques are kind of different. Mark, great. I, I'm glad that you like the uh, Great Lake stop sign technique. That color, definitely cool. All right, I'm going to try and get through some questions here. If I don't answer your question, it means I didn't actually see it um, because there's a bunch in here, and I'm not going to be able to scroll all the way up. Um, okay, so Jose, you said you signed up for a bunch of webinars. You never got an email with a recorded version. Okay, as far as I know, you have to at least log into the webinar, Jose. Um, but Jose, check the check the Nick Software YouTube page. Um, all of the webinars have been recorded. And as far as I know, they should be sent out after 24 hours in a follow-up email. Um, I see, yes. Uh, Peter has a question. Is there any way when utilizing control points, you could utilize them as a brush and not as a circle? Um, the way control points work, there, there's no way to change. You can change the size of the area of influence, but you can't change the shape of the area of influence or brush that out. Um, You'd have to use this kind of brush technique that we did in Photoshop, um, but you can't do that in the Nick plugins, unfortunately. That that said, the control points are not making a circular selection, but making a selection inside of the circle of similar tones, colors, and textures. Oh, neat. So James James has made a um, a composite preset, so a, um, a recipe in Color Effects Pro. Uh, that also creates a sort of solarization effect. That's cool, James. Thank you for that input. Um, if you have an email address. Okay, uh, let's see the next question. So let's see here. Uh, why cover this technique? Why, uh, David, I'm not, so, so I had a question that came in that says, why cover this technique? I'm just seeing it now, so I'm not sure what you mean. Uh, I apologize. Do you intend to include the Sabatier effect in future version of Solar Effects? I think it's cool. I don't think I can do it myself. Omar, uh, I don't think so. Um, I wish I had a good infrastructure for sharing presets that I made. Um, I don't know if they would put that into Silver Effects. I'll, I'll, I'll ask. Because I can absolutely make, you know, I can technically make like five or ten different um, solarization presets that kind of do slightly different things based upon those curves, and uh, that would be a, an interesting set of presets if if you like the technique. Uh, right, that one we answered. Does it have to be a smart object? Eileen, no. So um, you can use smart objects when utilizing the Nick plugins from Photoshop, but it doesn't have to be a smart object. In fact, we didn't use the smart object workflow here. Uh, are the Envogue presets your silver effects presets? If they're silver effects, how did you get them? <laughs> yeah, Vicky, Vicky, I actually made all of those Envogue uh, presets. So all of the presets that are that were released in this in well in January I think it was when they were actually released I created for color effects HDR effects Silver Effects Pro um, and analog effects I I built those for Nick Software. Um, okay, Janet, are you still there? Let me know, Janet. In the old days, it was called solarization. Yeah, Michael, I, I just sound fancier when I call it Sabatier effect. And ac actually, what's funny is that a, a whole group of photographers, um, you know, kind of discovered that effect at similar times and kind of named it after themselves. Somehow, Sabatier, it stuck more, I guess. That's what we ended up learning in, um, in school. How about stating in, oh, how about stating in DxO software boycotting Adobe? Finn, these are good questions. Um, th these effects, these this technique uh, couldn't be done within the Photo Lab software. Uh, uh, 
Uh, could you have opened the shadows with tonality protection slider? Yes, I, I think I'm way back on these questions. I'm not sure um, if, if folks are even still here. I, I see that there's 160 people still here, but I'm not sure if the questions uh, that I've got are folks that stuck around. Um, Martin, very good. I'm glad you liked it. The email with the link doesn't happen. Okay, Richard. Uh, I'm gonna. So I've I've talked to DXO and they they said that they have fixed whatever the email problem was before. Uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna try and figure that one out. Oh, very cool, Jose. You said you're a RIT Biomed alumni. You studied under Michael Perez. I work with Michael Perez. I I'm um I'm working on the RIT Big Shot with him, and I teach in the photo science program as well. That's so fun. I'm glad you made it, Jose. That's very cool. Okay, so I'm getting a couple bits of feedback here that the emails with the uh, links actually aren't coming through. So um, I, I'm gonna, I'll ask about that, and I'm, I'm gonna go into the GoToWebinar control panel when we log out and um, take a look because I think I can actually change the settings in there. Um, and I don't want to do anything without asking DxO because I don't actually work for DxO. I, I do these webinars for DxO because they they trust that I can create these these presentations, and um, I really like doing it because it's fun to share this stuff. So uh, let's see. Brad, you said you got off of the Adobe Plantation. Good. Uh, what editors exist that can use this workflow with layers, Affinity Pro, Luminar? Yeah, Luminar actually would work this way, but I don't know if you can plug the Nick plugins into uh, the Skylum software. I actually know very little about Affinity Pro Photo, so I couldn't I couldn't answer that one. That one's on my list to check out because I haven't actually used Affinity. Any chance there's a future webinar on how to use Nick for astrophotography? I that would be great. Um, I don't have any astro photographs, although I could go into like the, the NASA files, NASA images, and put stuff together in Fitz Liberator, but I don't know if that's what you're asking necessarily. I'm not really an astrophotographer. I love this stuff, but I don't have the equipment. Uh, my friend Ten Ted Kinsman, who's a fellow faculty member, does do that, though. What's the quickest way to get rid of those dust spots? All right, so if I go back here... Um, the quickest way to get rid of these dust spots that are in here uh, would be to just use the clone tool. Um, if I do, where's my layers palette? Uh, there it is. If I use the clone tool on this layer, though, I don't think it's actually going to work. So stamp, clone stamp tool, make a selection near it. It does. It actually did clean it up pretty well. I was thinking it wouldn't work really well because um, the layer is set to, oh, my brush is really hard. Um, the layer is set to a luminosity blending mode, and that can do some weird stuff if there are color saturation differences or chroma differences between these dust spots. Doesn't look like it, though. So all I'm doing here is sampling outside of where the dust spot is in an area that looks like it would, you know, create a clean kind of effect and um, cloning those out. And I, I would typically do that after uh, after I make these kinds of contrast adjustments because I, I don't really see them. And also, if I don't do a good job on cleaning up the dust spots before I make the contrast adjustment, I'm just going to have to change it anyways. I'm just going to have to you know, redo it. Um, nice job. Look forward to more webinars. Cool. Okay, and somebody mentioned just now that uh, Marvin said that you could make this kind of composite using Affinity Photo. Thank you, Marvin. I'm, I'm not familiar with that software, so I, I can't really um, talk too much about that. Jose, that's great. I'm, I'm really excited. So, and I got another, Bart mentioned too. Oh, no, Bart asked if it could be done in Affinity Pro. Uh, and yes, Bart, apparently this can happen. You, know, you can utilize this sort of multiple layer workflow and probably even this one because I imagine if Affinity has layers and layer uh, blending modes, um, it would be pretty straightforward to be able to do that. Ah, Kent gave me some detail here. Uh, the French scientist Armand Sabatier published in 1926, or no, sorry, in 1860 on October 26th, uh, the process Thank you, Kent. That's from Wikipedia. 
Gotta love that, you know, internet search. It's great. Uh, okay, and so another thing that's weird. Nick said you have been getting the emails, so that's funky. Would you repeat the shortcut to activate a control point? Uh, I'm sorry, Mary. I'm not following that that question. Would you repeat the shortcut to act? Oh, if you want to create a new control point, Mary, you'd hit Shift Command A on a Mac, and that would be Shift Control A if you're on a PC. Uh, Marvin says I use Nick with the Affinity Photo software on uh, Windows and on Mac. Thank you, Marvin. Uh, is there a way to create a mask and go through dust spots when there are a lot? Um, I'm in, yes, there probably was, there is in Photoshop. There is a very easy way to do it in Lightroom. Um, and uh, there's basically literally a checkbox in Lightroom and it, it, it creates a kind of mask effect. In Photoshop, there's probably someone out there um, that actually has created a, an action for that, that, that creates the mask so it's more, it's easy to see uh, the edges of those things. Um, yeah. And Nick mentioned again uh, that, that the emails have been coming through for him. So it's funny because some people are getting those emails and some people aren't. And I, I keep hearing that people aren't. So uh, do you anticipate a new version of Silver Effects Pro anytime soon? Omar, I don't know. So the thing is, is I, I again, I don't really work for, I do, I, I'm, if you will, contracted to do these webinars for DxO, but they're based in France. I'm based in Rochester, New York. I talk to them, you know, when there's problems in every few weeks, we have update sort of emails, but uh, I don't really know what they're doing um, with the software. I do know that they are developing the software because they are continue to add presets and they are um, keeping up the updates so that the software continues to work as new pieces of, um, you know, host software comes out and new operating systems come out. Um, but I don't know, you know, what their plan is. Uh, all right. Omar, no worries. My pleasure. George, you said, will there be more webinars uh, coming up before year end? Absolutely. George, yes, for sure. Um, and George, I'm sorry if, if you, I don't know if I pronounce your name, Jorge or George, or if you go by either. Um, but there are more webinars coming up. And uh, there's coming up this month. I have another webinar. Well, this is this webinar. I think I have one more this month. It's this one, HDR Effects Pro Essential Workflow. I don't have any more. I have just one more, right, next week. Yeah, next Wednesday I have got my last one on um, HDR Effects Pro. But as far as I know, we're going to be continuing to to do more webinars um, every month. Uh, that's that's the plan right now. You know, I, they, at any some time they, they could say, you know, we've got to stop. But as far as I know, we're going to continue to have them. Anyways, thanks, ladies and gentlemen. I greatly appreciate you guys coming out. I think I've answered all the questions. If I have not, um, you know, feel free to log into any of these webinars. I'd love to see you again and uh, have a have a really wonderful evening. Oh, I got a comment here just mentioned. So Kent said, dust spot finder in Photoshop. I'm going to send this to everybody. Cool. Kent, thank you. Send to all. So hopefully everybody gets, so jump into that questions box. I think I just sent this to everybody. I just copied and pasted Kent's um, answer. Um, make a curve adjustment layer with several extreme wave points. Makes a weird solarization effect that makes the spots stand out. Another curves layer with an opposite set of waves can help other spots stand out. Most retouchers use this effect. Kent, that's awesome. Thank you for sharing that. I'm going to try it out once we get offline here so I don't embarrass myself with the 130 people here. <laughs> Thank you, Kent. Richard, I appreciate that. Thank you so much. All right. Have a really wonderful evening, ladies and gentlemen, and I hope to see you next week.